Hello class, uh, welcome again to our lectures and just to make sure we understand where we are chronologically with this lecture, we are continuing on with our discussion of criminal law and my intention is for, with this lecture is to try and finish criminal law so that the next time we meet we will do torts and torts is chapter 7 so read chapter 7 for the next lecture. Uh, you should have already read the two chapters that deal with criminal law. And to this point, what we've done with criminal law is we've given you an overview of crime in the United States where we gave you all the statistics and put things in a comparative perspective for you. We talked about how do you process a criminal case and we started talking about substantive criminal law or the elements of different kinds of crime. So we talked first about crimes against the person, and in talking about crimes against the person, we talked about a number of different kinds of crimes. So we talked about murder, we talked about manslaughter, we talked about assault, we talked about battery, we talked about uh, rape, we talked about robbery, we talked about mayhem, um, and those are the major crimes against the person. Today what we want to do is finish off something of criminal law and talk about crimes against property. Crimes against property. And again, we're not going to talk about every single crime, but I want to give you a sense of the major types of crimes against property. So when you look at crimes against your property, your, your book talks about a lot of these. Uh, it talks about arson. Arson is defined as the wrongful burning either intentionally or recklessly of real or personal property. Real property generally uh, is things like your home. Personal property would be things that you own that in the old days we used to refer to as chattel, uh, whether it's jewelry or maybe someone burns your car, burns up your car, that would be an example of property. The next type of crime against property is burglary. Now, burglary is the unlawful entry into premises, structures, and vehicles with the intent to commit larceny or theft or some other kind of felony. So when we talk about theft, theft is the taking of property without consent. Larceny is the wrongful taking of something without the use of force or fear. So both of these are different than robbery. Robbery is when there is force or fear that's involved with the taking of something. And that's why for robbery, it's categorized under the idea of crimes against person because you're putting someone in fear, an individual in fear. The next kind of crime against property is receiving stolen property. And this is where you have known or should have known that the property was stolen and you are purchasing it or receiving it anyway. So being from New York City, uh, this is something that we are very familiar with, where you go down the street on 42nd Street and Broadway in New York City, someone opens up their coat jacket and says, hey, how would you like a Rolex watch for $200? Well, right there, that should tell you there's something wrong here, okay? And they obviously don't want to give you any bill of receipt, and you purchase it anyway, and you start telling everybody, what a great deal you got. And then it turns out one of your friend's Rolexes is missing. So he takes the serial number on your new Rolex that you just purchased, and guess what? It was stolen from him. So the question is, would you be guilty of receiving stolen property? And in this context, the answer is probably yes, because the circumstances are one that you should have known. You should have known. <clears throat> I 
So those are the major kinds of crimes in regard to property. What I want to talk about now is we've talked about different kinds of crimes, and we talked about how this processing of criminal case works. So we want to talk about our parties to a crime and what happens and what does it mean in terms of charging someone with a criminal action. Generally, when we talk about parties to a crime, there are two types of parties, principles and accessories. Principles and accessories. Now, a principal is someone, an individual, who is directly involved in committing the crime. Whereas an accessory is a person who, though not present at the scene of the crime, and didn't directly commit the crime, either aided or abetted. Now why is this distinction important? Well, in some states, there are sentencing differences depending upon if you're a principal or an accessory. With, in some states, someone who is a principal receiving a more severe sentence. But what we're seeing in many, many states now is that both in the federal system and in the number of state system, the recent trend is to classify both of these individuals as principals. So in other words, it doesn't matter if you're an accessory or a principal, you're all going to be charged as principals if you had any role in the planning and commission of a crime. And there are some distinctions. So even states that have that distinguish between an accessory before the fact and an accessory after the fact. So the accessory before the fact is the person who participated in the planning but wasn't present at the scene of the crime, the person who aided and abetted, conspired, people say, and use that term. Now accessory after the fact is someone who assists the principal in evading capture. Evading capture. So if you're trying to evade capture, helping them that way, that does not make you guilty of the crime the principal committed. It is a separate criminal charge. And it is called in most states an accessory after the fact. And there are criminal penalties for being an accessory after the fact. Now, some states use the term conspirators. And when we talk about a conspirator, that's an agreement between persons to commit a crime. And in order to convict someone as a conspirator, you must show that there was some kind of agreement, either explicit, implied, or tacit. So you see this a lot with the, the major actions against organized crime, the mafia in New York City, where they will uh, try and record conversations. And uh, if someone's saying, yeah, you know, Please kill Joe Bonanno, okay? Uh, that's clearly an explicit conspiracy. But if the person's saying, hey, I want to whack Joe Bonanno, I hope that's okay with you, and the person doesn't say anything, but doesn't clearly say no, then it can be considered an implied or tacit agreement. And that person would be considered a co-conspirator. If someone is classified as a conspirator, they are held to the same penalty as the person who commits the crime. 
the same penalty as the principal. So that's how it works in regards to different kinds of parties to a crime. Now what we want to talk about are defenses to criminal actions. Defenses. So in other words, just because you commit a crime doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have to go to jail. Why? Because there are what are referred to as affirmative defenses to a criminal action. And one of the first that people talk about is defenses. I'll put that up here, defenses. Is the idea of duress. Duress. And duress means forced participation. And if you can show duress, duress can negate the criminal intent, the mens rea. Remember that term, the mens rea, you have to have a criminal state of mind. Well, if you didn't really want to do this, but you're being forced to do this against your will, then that is duress and it's not a criminal act for you. So duress can negate the intent needed to find for a crime has been committed by that person. And that applies to most types of criminal actions, either crimes against person or crimes against property. And probably the best example that I can think of uh, historically of this was Patty Hearst. Patty Hearst uh, was seen on a number of cameras and banks holding an automatic weapon and helping steal money with what was called the Symbionese Liberation Army, which was a radical group in the Oakland, San Francisco area. So they have her on tape, she's holding the machine gun, and then she's captured, and everybody is saying, well, she's obviously going to go to jail for a pretty long time. But at trial, she said, She's not guilty. She pleads innocent to the robbery. And she pleads innocent, citing duress. She said, yeah, I was there. Yeah, I had an automatic weapon. And by the way, there were no bullets in it. And I was told if I didn't participate, I would be shot and killed. So this was not my idea. I didn't want to commit this crime. I didn't have the appropriate criminal intent. And sure enough, she was found innocent based upon this affirmative defense of duress. Now duress, as I said, applies to most crimes, except one. Murder is never justified, legally, even if there's duress. So if you said, well, I had to kill Mr. Jones, because I was told if I didn't, I'd be killed. Well, too bad. You have to pay the penalty for murder no matter what. What other defenses are there to criminal action? This distinction between mistake of law versus a mistake of fact. I'm going to put it the other way. Mistake of fact versus a mistake of law. Okay, what does that mean and how does that apply? How does that apply? Well, mistake of law is never a defense. So in other words, you say, geez, I didn't know that was a crime here in Utah. I get high all the time in Colorado and everybody says, that's great. I didn't know you can't do it in Utah. Too bad. You go to jail. Mistake of fact is different. Mistake of fact means you didn't realize you were committing a specific type of crime. You thought you maybe were committing a different type of crime. So give me, I'll give an example of that. A thief takes a necklace 
and he thought it was worth $500. And it turns out it was worth $50,000. Well, if he can prove he really thought this was a petty crime, then that mistake of fact can mitigate against his guilty finding. Let me give you another example. And this one actually really happened, believe it or not. Um, there was a soldier who was in the military who was a, a new enlistee, a private, and he was called by his sergeant. And he said, Private, I want you to come over to the house. My wife and I are into kinky sexual scenarios. So what I want you to do is come in and act like you're restraining me. Then take my wife and she's going to protest. And then I want you to have sexual relations with her. And then afterwards, uh, we'll all celebrate because it's really fun and exciting. So the private believes him. He goes to the person's house. He restrains the sergeant. He takes the wife, he brings her into the bedroom, has sexual relationships. She's saying, oh, stop raping me, stop. Turns out, this was nothing she knew anything about. This was a way for her husband, the sergeant, to get even with her because he found out she was having an affair. So the private <clears throat> was able to prove through some uh, phone conversations that they had had, and a couple of texts that he had sent that he was under the belief that this was all some kind of sexual fantasy and he had no intent to have sexual relations with this woman against her will. So again, that would be a mistake of fact. And in that case, he was actually exonerated because he was able to prove that. What other defenses to crime do we have? Self-defense. <clears throat> so what's self-defense? Self-defense is a justified, violent conduct when used in defense of oneself or others. So you can assert self-defense if you're trying to protect other people. Well, what do you need? In order to have self-defense, you have to be confronted with genuine and reasonable fear of imminent danger or great bodily harm. And there's some variations on this. So for example, um, in some states, there's the no retreat rule, which basically says that an individual is not obliged to retreat in their own home. So in some states, you can even use deadly force in your own home, even if it's not against deadly force. But generally, what we see is, according to most state laws, deadly force can't be used against non-deadly force. So if someone comes in your home and punches you, and you take out a gun, and you shoot them in the head three times, okay, you might have a tough time showing that that was self-defense. Especially if you could have just pointed the gun and restrained them. Or if you take out the gun, and the person sees the gun and starts running, and you shoot them in the back three times. That's not self-defense anymore. All right. Another defense to a criminal action is what we refer to as entrapment. And if you remember, <clears throat> this was the defense that a lot of people associated with the Trump campaign used. So what is it? Entrapment is defense 
that states that the government or government actors incited the crime or induced someone to commit a crime that they wouldn't have committed. And you have entrapment only when the conduct of the law agent induces a normally law-abiding person to commit an offense they would normally not commit. But it has to be more than just affording them the opportunity. So in other words, if you send FBI agents into a public park, and someone comes over to them and says, hey, would you like to buy some cocaine or heroin? That is not entrapment. All right, they were going to do that. And all you're doing is providing the FBI agent to afford them opportunity to commit the crime they would normally commit. So it's got to be more than that. There has to be an inducement. There has to be an action that you're making them do something you wouldn't normally, they wouldn't normally do. <clears throat> so an example of that might be, and to kind of change up our example a little bit, an FBI agent goes into the public park and poses as a drug dealer. And he goes up to someone and he says, hey, Quentin, how about buying some heroin? And Quinn says, no, no, thank you. I really don't like heroin. Oh, come on, please buy the heroin. And oh, by the way, my grandmother has cancer and I need the money for the treatment for my grandmother's surgeries. So as in, at that point, Quentin being the nice person that he is, says, all right, here's a hundred bucks for your heroin. And then he says, ah, ha, ha, I got you, you're under arrest. Okay? Well, obviously that would be entrapment. That would be entrapment. Okay. So, what we've explained here are substantive criminal acts, crimes against person, crimes against property, the kinds of people who commit them and how they can be categorized, principles and accessories, or conspirators, the defenses, like duress, mistake of fact versus law, entrapment, self-defense. And once you go through this entire criminal process, someone can be found guilty or not guilty. And remember, not guilty doesn't mean you think they're innocent. All that means is you don't believe that the state proved their case beyond a reasonable doubt. Maybe you still have some doubts. You think the person probably did it, but geez, there's just not enough evidence. It's too much of a, what's referred to as a circumstantial case. Now, if someone's found guilty, then we have criminal sentencing. And in that context, you will hear the ideas of concurrent sentencing and consecutive sentencing. So, if it is a concurrent sentence, everything you're found guilty of, so maybe you're found guilty of uh, kidnapping, assault and battery, and manslaughter. But in a concurrent sentence, each year served in prison counts as a year served on each sentence. So what you're going to have to do is complete the longest sentence, but then when you complete the longest sentence, by definition, it also satisfies the lesser included sentences. And this is up to a judge. Does the judge want to do concurrent sentencing or consecutive sentencing? Now, what consecutive sentencing is very different. You're saying that the criminal must serve the complete sentence for each of the criminal violations. So if he's got uh, 18 years for manslaughter and four years for assault and battery and three years for kidnapping, he's got to serve all of those, the 18, the 5, and the 3, 
So he's got to serve 26 years, not just 18. And then as part of the sentencing process, we also have what are referred to as enhancements or add-ons. And again, it depends upon the state. And in some states, they refer to these as aggravated crimes. Okay, so aggravated bulk burglary. Uh, aggravated burglaries, burglary is committed with a firearm in some states. So if you commit a crime with a firearm, if you committed prior crimes, if you committed crimes against elderly, in a lot of states, those are kinds of violations that call for an enhancement or an add-on. And sometimes it's automatic. So if you commit a crime in certain states with a gun, it's a five-year enhancement. And there's no negotiation on that. All right. So at this point, we've completed everything in the first three Roman numerals. And we want to get to the last part of criminal law that we're going to talk about. And that deals with the idea of criminal procedure and constitutional protections. So in other words, you're charged with a criminal act. You're going to trial. And the question becomes, what protections do you have in this criminal law process? So once you're charged with a crime, in the United States, what we know is that the United States Constitution regulates many aspects of criminal procedures, but it is not a complete code. Therefore, both federal and state law are free to enact statutes as long as they don't violate required constitutional principles. A state can provide more protection of something that's constitutionally protected, but cannot require less protection of those rights. So when we talk about these constitutional protections in the United States, in our Constitution, we have said there's certain rights that anybody who's a citizen of the United States is entitled to in a criminal proceeding. And why? Because think about it. A criminal proceeding is a very significant action against an individual. If someone is criminally convicted, you can do what to many people in the United States is the unthinkable. You can take away their individual freedom. You can put them in cell for years and years. You can even take their life. So as a result of the severity of the different kinds of responses we can have to a criminal action, our founding father said, we want to make sure that before the state takes away someone's rights, before the state imprisons someone, before the state can take someone's life, that we have significant criminal procedural protections. So the major criminal procedure protections are the 4th, 5th, 6th, and 8th Amendments. And I want to read these to you, and then we're going to focus on two of them. 4th Amendment. The 4th Amendment says, The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable search and seizure shall not be violated. And no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause. So if we are going to get a warrant to search your house, we have to have probable cause. And it must particularly describe the place to be searched, and the persons or things to be seized. Now, we're going to have to explain what some of these terms mean. So when it says particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons and things to be seized, what does that exactly mean? And what does probable cause exactly mean? 
So you can't issue a warrant unless you have probable cause. What does that mean? Then we have the Fifth Amendment, which says, Nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy. So that includes the double jeopardy clause. Once you find someone not guilty, you can't try them with the same charge. Nor, and this is the one that we're going to be talking about a lot, shall they be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. So we cannot compel someone to testify. So this is where you hear people use the Fifth Amendment all the time. So again, a number of the people involved in the Trump campaign when asked, what did you do in these meetings? And what did you say? And who did you say it to? Pleaded the Fifth Amendment. They said, we have a right against self-incrimination. If you can prove we did something criminal, great, but we don't have to testify. Sixth Amendment. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury and has to be confronted with witnesses that are against him and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. So the Sixth Amendment calls for a speedy trial, a public trial, an impartial jury, the right to confront witnesses against you, and the right to have assistance of counsel in a criminal case. Again, remember, that's a criminal case, not a civil case. In a civil case, it's up to you to get your attorney. And then the Eighth Amendment, which says excessive bail shall not be required, nor cruel and unusual punishments be inflicted. So this is the cruel and unusual punishment. So what's cruel and unusual punishment? And generally, in that context, what we find that they find that anything that's disproportionate is cruel and unusual punishment. So if someone uh, assaults someone and batters them, they can't be put to death for that. That's disproportionate. All right, so those are the major constitutional protections. So what we want to do is we want to talk about these, and we want to talk about the two major protections here. Fourth Amendment, and the whole idea of unreasonable search and seizures, and Fifth Amendment, the right against self-incrimination. So first we want to ask, is the Fourth Amendment good law? Is it good law? Should we need a warrant before we can search? Why? 